Well, good morning. It is good to be here. It's good to see the Haley's back. I particularly appreciate having Andy back, so I don't have to lead the music. Uh, he does a much better job than I do, so uh, it is good, good to see him. Uh, we are in Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, and we are speaking of the subject of putting off sin in light of who Jesus is, in light of the revelation of Christ and what he has done. There is a profound change in the life of those who have been motivated by Christ, who understand who he is and what he has done. So our text this morning is Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. I want to go back, actually, we'll start in uh, verse 5, just to get our context. Verse 5 says, Therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them, and then our text, but now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. Now let's pray and ask the Lord to help us this morning. Lord, we need you. We desperately need you. I desperately need you. I am a sinner. Like Isaiah cried out when he saw your throne, when he cried out curses on his head, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell among people of unclean lips. I, I feel that way today. I am tasked with, tasked with this responsibility, this privilege of proclaiming the word of God, of proclaiming the duty of the Christian to put off sin, and yet I myself struggle. And I pray that you'd help me to faithfully apply this text to your people and to my own heart. It has been so sanctifying as I've studied it, Lord, and I pray that you'd help me now. Give me utterance as I preach it, that you would be glorified, that your people here this morning would see Jesus as you really are, and not some construct that we make up, not some God in our own image, but who you really are. You call us to this life of holiness. I pray that you would guide me, direct me, Lord. I do not deserve this grace, and yet you give it, and I need it. Amen. I remember back when I was in college, which is getting longer and longer ago, uh, it's very interesting how quick it seems the time has passed, and yet it's been over 20 years, when we would go out onto the city on Friday nights, some friends of mine, and we would evangelize the area, it was in Pensacola, Florida, and there were lots of homeless people um, which I thought was bad, and it's gotten much worse here in California, uh, uh, especially if you go down into some of the places uh, in L.A. where I was at school for seminary. But we would go street preaching, preaching uh, or street evangelizing. We'd passing out tracts and, and sharing the gospel. It was a good time. Um, but I remember one man in particular. He was laying on a park bench, and you never knew when you approached guys that were laying on, on the streets, whether they would have the uh, ability to understand, because most of the time they were drunk or they were induced with some kind of drug stupor. And uh, this, this guy was very, uh, very understanding. He was easy to talk to. It was very interesting because I expected, uh, as I went up to him, that I would be talking to another homeless guy, uh, unkept as he was, dirty, living on the streets. Uh, but I discovered as I was interacting with him that he was actually a uh, butcher, owned a butcher shop, 
and had done very well in his business. In fact, he told me that he'd done so well that he had, if he wanted to go to his bank account and pull out fifty or $60,000, it wouldn't even hurt him to go do. And so here's this guy in, uh, in modest standards, was somewhat wealthy, living on the streets, living as a homeless guy. He had given up on life, absolutely tired of life. He'd walked out on his family. He was married, he had kids, and he'd, he ba- abandoned them and was living on a park bench in Pensacola, Florida. And, uh, I, you know, I tried to share the gospel with him. He had no interest. I tried to help him to, uh, to see his need to, to go back to his family, and he just didn't want anything to do with it. And I left rather saddened. As many times that I left homeless people in that day, but this was particularly saddening because he was a man who didn't live according to the reality of his life, at least in terms of physical. He had money, he had wealth, he had family, he had a home to go back to, but he chose to live on the streets. The way he dressed and where he lived didn't fit with the reality of who he actually was. And I've thought about this a lot since then. He acted like poor, but in reality he had wealth. And how many Christians of us, how many of us Christians live like this? How many of us, we act as if we're poor in our reality, uh, but our reality is that in Christ we are very rich. We live enslaved to sin, it seems, it feels, struggling. But the Bible teaches us that we have been set free from Christ. We have been raised to new life. We have been raised to a life that is hidden in Christ, and yet we live often as if this isn't true. We live in our lives, in our practical world, as if we are still bound up in our sin, like homeless on the streets. But this is not what we're called to do. We are called to live in light of who Christ is. We are called to be who we are in Christ. If you are truly in Christ, then live like it. That's the call. Don't pretend to be what you are not. Don't live like the world because you are not of the world. You have been raised out of this world, and so you are to put to death those things that lie about who you really are. You are to put to death the sins that lie so that you can live in a way that reflects who you are in Christ. Be who you are. That's the message. That's the message of Paul in Colossians. He has showed us who Christ is. He is shown us that Christ is the exalted Lord, the one who is before all things, the one who existed before. He's the great I am. He's Yahweh. He's the one who has created all things. He has all power and ruler. He rules over all authorities. This is Christ. And he came and he died and he purchased our freedom. And then we have been raised with him And so we are called to live in that reality. We are called to live in the reality of who we are in Christ. And that's our text, Colossians 3, 8 through 9, provides two realities regarding the remaining sin in our life that we need to know in order to live faithfully if we've been risen in Christ. And so Paul begins here in verse 8 with this mandate to take off filthy rags, to take off filthy rags. He says, but now you also put them all aside. Lay them aside. This word here is a word that refers to taking off clothing. It's to strip off clothing. That's what he's saying. He's he's saying that we need to be in the business of stripping off the sin that resides in our flesh. The text literally says, but now you also strip off all the things. And by 
saying the things, Paul is referring to all the things that bring the wrath of God. This list that he's given us in verse 5, and then he continues on here in verse 8. These are all the things that we need to be laying aside. We need to be stripping off like filthy rags from our bodies. Paul had said at the beginning of verse 5 that we are to put them to death. We are to put them to death because Christ has brought us to new life. And now he changes the imagery here. And he says that we are to strip them off. We are to strip them off. We are to lay them aside. This is the same word, this word lay aside that we saw in Colossians 2 verse 15. Where Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities. He literally stripped off the rulers, and the authorities. Christ defeated the powers that once held sway over us. He stripped all the power of all the rulers and the authorities that claimed to have power over us. We were under the sway of spiritual darkness. And like cloaks of darkness, we were wrapped about by these, th- this darkness that made impossible demands. We were enslaved to these rulers and authorities. But Christ says that he stripped them away. He stripped away the darkness. He removed the rulers and authorities that laid claim to your soul. And so the response now is that you are to strip away the remnants, the sin that is still in your body. If a man were to be dead and exposed to the elements of his rot... To, if he were to be exposed to the elements in his body rotten, in his clothes rot, and then if that same man were to be brought to life again, you would expect that that person would take off those funeral rags. And that's the imagery here. You have been raised to new life. And so now you need to strip off the funeral rags. That's what the sin is in your body. It's like rags that cling to you, and you need to be about the business of taking them off in order to put on new clothing so that you are who you are in Christ. Remove the rags of our former self because we've been raised to new life. This is what Paul is saying. We need to put on the things that are consistent with our new life in Christ. J.C. Ryle put it this way. He said, this is war. There's a warfare of far greater importance than any war that was ever waged by man. It is a warfare that concerns not two or three nations only, but every Christian man and woman born into the world. This warfare, I am aware, is a thing of which many know nothing. Talk to them about it, and they are ready to set you down as a madman, an enthusiast, or a fool. And yet it is as real and true as any war the world has ever seen, It has its hand-to-hand conflicts and its wounds. It has its watchings and fatigues. It has its sieges and assaults. It has its victories and its defeats. Above all, it has consequences which are awful, tremendous, and most peculiar. In earthly warfare, the consequences of tenations are often temporary and remediable. In spiritual warfare, it is a very different thing. Of that warfare, the consequences, when the fight is over are unchangeable and eternal. So what J.C. Ryle is saying is that Christianity is a fight. It is going to war. This is what Christianity is. This is what it means to be in Christ. It is to lay aside these things that are not reflective of who we are in Christ. We must fight because our flesh is much more comfortable in the clothes of our former life. Our flesh has an acute case of Stockholm Syndrome. Do you know what that is? It's when you become, you develop a strong bond, or certain people who have been enslaved develop a strong bond to their captors. That's what our flesh has done. We've developed a bond to what formerly enslaved us. It's natural for our flesh to hang on tightly to the old rotten rags of our former life. And so we need to fight. We need to fight our flesh because our flesh does not know what's good for us. It always gravitates toward what it believes to be the most pleasurable and most satisfying 
But it is naturally deceived. It is naturally gravitating toward the things that bring death. And so we must be about the business of stripping off those things that are of our former life. And Paul says in verse 8, the first thing that we are to strip off is anger. Anger. We are to strip off the filthy rag of anger and wrath. Anger is a strong displeasure. It's a focus here on the emotional aspect. When, when, we speak of, when it speaks of anger here, it's speaking of the emotion, the impulsive state of human disposition. It's a smoldering bitterness that is inside. It, it, wrath, in contrast, is the outworking of it. So both of them are related. Anger and wrath, often smoldering bitterness, works out into a boiling over. In fact, this word wrath is the word we get thermos from. It is a boiling over. It's, it's, it's from this idea of welling up and boiling over. It is uh, originally denoted a violent movement of water, air, ground, animals, or men. And so you have anger, which is the internal smoldering, and then the wrath, which is the outburst of that smoldering. This internal bitterness that it overflows into external rage. We are to put them off. We are to strip off. Because anger and wrath is like playing with fire. It must be handled with great care. It's not something that we should be uh, venting. Proverbs 29, 11 says, a fool always vents his temper, but a wise man hold it, holds it back. Proverbs 6.34 tells us that anger brings trouble. It brings great trouble, for jealousy enrages a man. He will not spare in the day of vengeance. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A man of great anger will bear the penalty, Proverbs 19.19. For if you rescue him, you will only have to do it again. So it's somebody who constantly is giving in to this anger, and it brings destruction in his life. Proverbs 22, 24 says that we should avoid anger completely. Do not associate with a man given to anger, or go with a hot-tempered man. Proverbs 14, 17 says an angry man is a fool. A quick-tempered man acts foolishly, and a man of evil devices is hated. Proverbs 14, 29, He who is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who is quick-tempered exalts folly. He who is slow to anger, Proverbs 16, 32, is better than the mighty, and he who rules the spirit than he who captures a city. And so anger is something that we are not to associate with. It brings trouble, and it is of the realm of those who are foolish. Ephesians 4.26, it links anger and sin together. Ephesians 4.26 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. And the idea here, and he's quoting from Psalm 4.4 when Paul says that, but the idea here is he's linking anger and sin together. If one is angry, sin is crouching at the door. It's right there. And so, in order to respond, you must deal with it quickly. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, or you will find yourself in sin. You must put it away. Deal with it quickly. In fact, if you don't, you are aiding Satan. Ephesians 4.27 says, Do not give the devil an opportunity. So anger is in the realm of of Satan. It gives him an opportunity to do what Satan is doing. And so we are to put away anger. We are to deal with it quickly. James 1.19, sort of in a counterbalance to Ephesians 4.26, says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So Ephesians 4.26 says you must deal with your anger quickly. James 1.19 says you must be slow to become angry. These are, this anger and this wrath is not something that should be in our life. 
James 1.20, the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Anger is not in the realm of those who have been risen with Christ, whose life have been hidden in Christ, who have received the righteousness of Christ. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Now, this is counterintuitive. Because when we become angry, it is our own righteousness that we are becoming angry over. It is our, uh, something that we've become offended about. Somebody who's done something to us or something that has caused us and our sense of self-righteousness to rise up. The Bible says that it does not achieve the righteousness of God, which should be our goal. It isn't about our own righteousness. It isn't about our own rights. Anger is exclusively, when we're talking about mankind in the Bible, almost exclusively negative. And this is very interesting because this is one of these sins that we sort of accept. You know, it's an acceptable sin. You know, some people just, they're just a little hot tempered. But the way the Bible deals with it, when people were angry, it is almost exclusively negative, almost exclusively negative in the category of sin. That's because it is very rare for a man to become angry over the things that produce the righteousness of God because they care so much about the righteousness of God. Anger is almost always rooted in our own self-righteousness. But in reality, anger is the domain of God, not man. It is the domain of God, not man. It is an essential an inalienable trait of God. For example, Psalm 711, God is a righteous God and a God who has indignation every day. And that word every, the, the idea of every day is always. God is full of wrath because he is righteous and there are sinners, there is wickedness. And so God will visit judgment and wrath on those who are wicked. That's his domain, not ours. That's his trait, his attribute. Jeremiah 15, 14, then I will cause your enemies to bring it into a land that you do not know. For a fire has been kindled in my anger. It will burn upon you. Jeremiah 17, 4, and you will even of yourself let go of your inheritance that I gave you. And I will make you serve your enemies in the land which you do not know. For you have kindled a fire in my anger which will burn forever. Isaiah 65, 5 says that I am holier than you. These are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. The reality is that God will visit anger on the unjust. That's what hell is. Hell is real. Hell is for unrepentant sinners who are under the wrath of God. And this is why the gospel is a call to repent, to turn away from your sins, to turn to Christ, to find grace in Christ who has paid the price for your sins. He bore the wrath of God on the cross. He came up under the anger of God on the cross for you and I. It is his domain for God to become angry. And so we must repent from anger. We must turn away from our sins. And turn to Christ and run to his love and to his grace and to his mercy. And when you allow anger to simmer and eventually overflow into wrath, you are exalting yourself in the place of God. You are making your realities, your desires as if they are God's. We are those who are to humble ourselves. This is why Romans 12, 9 says... Never take your revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Our job is to humble ourselves and to trust that God will take care of injustice. God will deal. And we are to strip off the rags of wrath, of anger and wrath. And then, Paul says we must strip off the filthy rag, take off the filthy rag of malice. Malice, a mean-spirited or vicious attitude or disposition. 
It's to have ill will. It's an attitude of wickedness towards someone with the intention of doing harm. It's like level up from anger and wrath. It's to let bitterness seep in and poison you until all that's left is, is malice and hatred. This is the ultimate end or the, the progress of what anger and wrath do to you. This is why you must strip off anger and wrath. You must cut it off because it will become malice. And malice is a desire to see someone hurt or ruined. Matthew Henry says it's worse than anger and wrath because it is more rooted and deliberate. It, deliberate. it is anger heightened and settled. And it is characteristic of the depraved of depraved people in Romans 1.29 who are filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips. Those enslaved to sin are full of malice. Titus 3.3, 3, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice. This was all they did outside of Christ and before Christ, this is what we did. There are certain people that we just hated. We had malice toward them. The, the, the way they treated us, the way they were condescending toward us. And so there's this bitterness that would root up. And so we would spend our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. This is characteristic of those who are not whose life have not been hidden with Christ. It is the realm of wicked men. Psalm 50, verse 16 through 19. Those who associate with adulterers, who let their mouth loose in evil, they speak out of their heart, out of their deep-rooted bitterness. And that's where malice is rooted. It is a deep-rooted bitterness that works out on the tongue. This is what the Pharisees were. They, were held, they held an intense malice and contempt toward Jesus. They hated him because they were jealous of him. Because he was able to draw crowds and they wanted the crowds. They loved the praise of men. And so they became bitter toward him. In Matthew 12, verse 33, Jesus said to them, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. And then Jesus says this, very strong words, You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. In other words, you are evil in your heart, and so your mouth speaks evil. You can't do anything else but that. This is what you are. You speak out of your heart. But the good man brings out of his good treasure what is good. The evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is good. Or, or uh, evil treasure what is evil. And listen to this, I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an account for in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Why? Because they show what is in your heart. They demonstrate what is in your heart. Malice is an outward demonstration often in the tongue, of what's going on in your heart or the bitterness that is in your heart. If your heart is full of anger and wrath, your words will be full of malice. It's a natural progression. Speech is often the outworking of the internal heart condition. James 3, 4 through 12 speaks of the tongue like a rudder on a ship. How great a uh, a power the tongue has, like a, like a rudder can turn a ship. The tongue is a small part of the body, yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. So the tongue is a fire. It only takes a spark to, to start a fire. And so the tongue, it, it starts these fires. It can cause all of this damage for every species of beasts, and birds of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father. With it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of, men, of, of God. 
From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. What we speak matters. How we speak matters. And malice is an outworking of a bitterness that is deep inside of us. And we need to strip it off. We need to remove it from us. And then Paul says we need to take off the filthy rag of slander, another outworking of speech. Whenever this word in the Bible is speaking of slander, or whenever you see it translated as slander in the New Testament, uh, it's speaking of men directing toward men. When it's used in relation to God, this word is translated as blasphemy. It's literally the word blasphemy. We are to put off blasphemy. We are to strip away blasphemy. The majority of the New Testament uses this word in relation to a violation of the power and majesty of God. But when it's about slander, it's, it, is a, it is directed toward man and is aimed at attacking image bearers. And the reason it is blasphemy, the reason why this word is appropriate is because it degrades the person and makes him less or her less than the image of God that he or she is. It's blasphemy. When you speak against someone to tear that person down, to dehumanize and to degrade somebody, to slander somebody, to speak lies for the purpose of dragging them down, to make them less than the image of God that they are, it is blasphemy, it is evil, it is wicked. And Titus 3, 2 says, do not slander anyone. Sometimes it's translated as speak evil of no one. Do not blaspheme anyone. We are not to, it doesn't matter who it is. So you know this, this whole uh, thing where people are going around and speaking of Brandon and relating to Biden, you, you know that whole, that's slander. That, that shouldn't be in our mouth. We don't speak things like that. We don't tear down anybody. It doesn't matter who it is. Whether it's the president, or whether it's the greatest fool, or the wisest being on the, on the planet, we do not tear people down. We don't slander people. We need to strip this off. We do not speak to defame anyone. We have the power to use our tongue to either bless or curse God. We represent Christ to the world And the greatest representation of Christ to the world is our tongue. It's what we say. It's how we say it. It shows us whether we're genuine or not. This is why by our words we will be condemned or justified. It shows what's really going on in our heart. This is why James 3.9 says we... With our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of men. This link between God and man being created in the likeness of man. When we speak words against mankind to tear them down, we are ultimately speaking them against God who created them. This is serious, and it needs to stop. We need to strip it off. And Paul called himself a blasphemer. 1 Timothy 1.13, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and persecutor and violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And Paul was ignorant, and he blasphemed. He spoke slander of God and of men, of those who followed God, but he did it ignorantly. And yet how often do we do it knowing full well that we shouldn't? How much greater is Our accountability, slander belongs to the realm of Satan and his followers. The beast of Revelation, uh, in Revelation 13, verse 5 through 6, says that there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authorities to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. So he spoke slander, blasphemy against God and all that is God's. That's what Satan does. He seeks to tear down all that is God, to to bring uh, blasphemy against anything that God has done or created or purposed. And those who follow the beast, Revelation 13, 8, will worship him. They will worship the greatest blasphemer of all. 
This is not us. So we must strip it off, take off the filthy rag of slander. And Paul says we must take off the filthy rag of abuse, abuse, or shameful speech, shameful speech. It probably is referring to uh, a kind of talk that, that spreads scandalous claims about someone with the intention of damaging the reputation because it's preceded by blasphemy. So I think he, it's something of the tongue. The idea here, when we're speaking of shame, uh, it's much broader than just words that you speak. Shameful behavior uh, is the idea, either socially or morally. So it isn't necessarily something that uh, is morally shameful, but it could be socially or unacceptable. In this case, I think it's shameful words, obscene words, words really meant to tear people down and bring them into shame, to malign them, to speak evil of them, to degrade them, and to debase them. Whenever the Bible talks about shame, it's always with this idea of degrading or debasing activity. For example, Genesis 2.25, Adam and Eve were naked and they were not ashamed in front of each other. Shame didn't enter into that relationship until sin entered into the relationship. Nahash sought to bring shame to Israel by gouging out their right eye. So the goal of the nations was to shame the nation of Israel. Titus tells us that false teachers are those who use their tongues for the purpose of shame. They would teach shameful things. Titus 1.11, they must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things that they, they should not teach for the sake of shameful gain. And there's, there's other examples of shame and how it degrades and it shouldn't have any part either morally or socially or whatever, you hear it, you see it, and you think, well, that is a shameful, that is a shameful thing. In Philippians 1, 15 through 20, some were using Paul's imprisonment to exalt themselves from putting down Paul in order to shame him. Paul refused to let himself be put to shame. Those who persecute Christians, 1 Peter 4, 16, do it to shame them. And Paul, uh, Peter tells them that they are not to feel shame when they're persecuted. And Christians who fall for the lies of false teachers will feel ashamed when they stand before Christ. So shame is not something that we should be practicing. It's not something that we should be doing, and it's certainly not something that we should be speaking. We are those who have taken refuge in Yahweh, Psalm 71.1. So we are not put to shame. We are not in the realm of of those who are shamed. And so, Ephesians 4, 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear it. We are to speak words that lift up, not tear down. We must strip off abusive, shameful speech. You know, this, we need to be careful about what we say. We need to be careful about how we treat people. What we need to understand is that we are speaking, when you're speaking with someone, you're speaking with someone who has been created in the image of God. And what you say has reflection on, who you, on your view of God. It is a big deal. And then finally in this list, Paul says to take off the filthy rag of lying. The filthy rag of lying. This is what is natural for the unbeliever. Romans 125 speaks of people giving over to their depravity, exchanging truth for a lie. We live in a day where we're seeing that happen, where truth doesn't even matter anymore. The facts of a case don't even matter. It's all about the narrative anymore. We have we are living in a day where the truth has been exchanged for a lie. John 8, 44 says that Satan is the father of liars. It is his nature to lie. And so those who practice lying are testifying that they are the children of Satan. If, if, you, are, if you are a liar, like Jesus called the Pharisees a liar, uh, John 8, 44, he says, you are of your father, the devil. 
you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. We are not one who is, uh, who is Satan as our father. We have been risen to new life in Christ. God is our father and so we speak truth. This is what it means to be a believer. It means to accept the truth, to realize the truth to repent from our sins, to repent from our lies, and turn toward the truth. Titus 1-2, God cannot lie. And therefore, we do not lie. We do not practice lying because it is something that is not godly in any way. 1 John 1-6, lying is to walk in darkness. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. 1 John 2.21, I've written to you because you do not know the, the truth, but because uh, I've written to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. We are of the truth. And so we cannot be the ones who practice lying. This is very interesting. In Revelation 14.5, it speaks of... Uh, a believing people, and it, the 144,000 Jews, and it says that no lie was found in their mouth, and they are blameless. It's an interesting reality, a, a complete transformation from the way Israel was. They eventually came to this point where they were liars, and they were full of blame, and then in 14.5, it says, no lie is found in their mouth. This is praiseworthy, that they are no longer liars. They do not speak lies. Revelation 21.27 says that those who practice abomination and lying will not come into the new Jerusalem. Nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So liars will not inherit the kingdom. We are not those who lie. A lying tongue is abomination, Proverbs 6, 17. It's on par with murder of the innocent. It spreads strife among the brethren. At the heart of all of these is this bitter Jealousy and selfish ambition, James 3, 14 through 16. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. But wisdom is not that which, uh, this wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. So when we have this kind of heart and we speak lying, we are not speaking as if we have been raised to life, as if our knowledge is coming down from God, but rather it is one that is dynamic. It is in the realm of Satan. And so we must strip off lying. We must have no part in our life. So we, must, uh, so we see this mandate to strip off these filthy rags. And then Paul gives us the motivation. At the end of verse 9, the motivation to strip off the filthy rags. It says, do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. The old self, the rags of the old man, you set them aside. We have been raised to new life. 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. We died, we rose with Christ, we have been risen again to a new life. The old man was put to death. We have a new nature. Our lives are now those who are hidden with Christ. And so this is who we are now. We must be who we are. We are no longer slaves to what we were. Our old self was crucified with him, Romans 6, 6. In order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Galatians 5.24, now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. We have been raised to new life. The old man has been killed. He's put to death. And so we need to take off those funeral rags. We need to pull them off, strip them off. 
They have no part of our new life in Christ. Strip off the rags of the old man. He's dead and all that's left is the rags of his former life. And so therefore, we must put aside all filthiness and all that remains of the wickedness and humility. Receive the word implanted which is able to save your souls. James 1.21. Hebrews 12.1. Motivation by the great crowd of, cloud of witnesses from Hebrews 11, the many who went before us, who suffered persecutions, who refused to live like the world, who were seeking a better kingdom, and they lived in such a way that they were marked out by the world, and the world persecuted them, and the Bible says that they were unworthy, the world was unworthy of these, and they went before us, and because of this, therefore, we have such a great cloud of witnesses, those who have gone before us, who have demonstrated what it means to live in a life that is pleasing to the Lord, to walk blameless. Let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. This is our mission now. Lay aside these things. Sin, it continues to dwell in our body, and our flesh, but the night is almost gone, and the day is near. And so we must fight. Romans 13, 12, Therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. This is our mission. Put these things aside. Work at this. Fight. Don't let these things continue to rule you, to entangle you. Let me finish with J.C. Ryle. He says, Let us remember that the eye of our loving Savior is upon us morning, noon, and night. He will never suffer us to be tempted above that we are able to bear. He can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, for he suffered himself being tempted. He knows what battles and conflicts are, for he himself was assaulted by the prince of this world. And so having such a high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. We are His. And let us remember that time is short and the coming of the Lord draws nigh. A few more battles. And the last trumpet shall sound and the Prince of Peace shall come to reign on a renewed earth. A few more struggles. And conflicts, and then we shall bid an eternal goodbye to warfare and to sin and to sorrow and to death. So then, let us fight to the last and never surrender. Thus says the captain of our salvation He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And so we must. Fight on. We must be who we are. God has called us to a new life. And so let's be that. It begins here. It begins in our relationship toward each other. My prayer for you is that you would search your heart and where these things are there. Anger. It's not a simple thing. It's not a minor thing. If, if you struggle with anger, and you know, I'm just a hot-tempered person. No, it's a big deal. It needs to die. Wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech, lying. These things need to go. We need to live as if we truly are risen to life because we are. We have the power. We have the spirit. We have lots and lots of material to help you. If you're struggling with this, we have lots and lots of, of uh, stuff on the back, uh, the rack in the lobby there. I uh, would love to talk. would love to walk through the scripture. We can fight this. This doesn't have to be us. Lord Jesus, help us to fight. Help us to be faithful. This is not something that happens just by sheer will but it's something that happens through your spirit and the power of your word, the putting off and the putting on. And Lord, as we continue into this study, 
looking at the sin, I pray that there would be a sense in our own soul of disgust. Oh God, that you would convict us when we become angry. Already I have found myself prone toward it after studying it and seeing it in tiny little ways and how disgusting it is. I pray that you would convict us, that you would help us, that we could truly be those who show Christ to each other and to the world. What we speak would be honoring to you in every way. You would be pleased and you would hear us say, well done, well done. Faith Baptist Church, well done. When the rest of the churches were being distracted, you were fighting the fight I called you to. Lord, may that be true of us. We pray this in your name. Amen.